Good morning, church family. It's really good to be with you uh, together this morning, and it's hard to believe that last week was Easter, and what a joy it was to be with you together and to know that while we were in different places, we were all worshiping the same God, we were celebrating the same risen Savior, and uh, across this community and even more broadly across this state, and for some of you even further away, we were worshiping the one name of our one great God. And again, while a great joy, don't get me wrong, we miss you terribly. Your church staff misses you. Um, I know that you miss one another, and your pastor misses you as well. And, uh, and I just wanted to tell you that uh, we can't wait until we're together again. We, we desire to be together with you. This week, we were prepared to begin a new series called Stand Firm. And in that series, we're going to talk about unshakable hope and unwavering faith. And I can promise you it's a great series, and I can promise you we're going to be getting to it soon. But that's not what, while it was our plan for today, it's not what God's plan was for today. There are different times in the life of a church where a different sermon is called for. And you know these different types of sermons, whether you know them or not by name. There are times where we have to uh, use the didactic, which is the teaching portions of Scripture, and we might teach textually, starting with a passage of Scripture and jumping off from that point. We might have seasons where we preach to you expositorily, where we will begin with a book of the Bible and go through that in a systematic way. And then there's times where we preach topically, where we, uh, where we grab a topic that we know is burning on the heart of our pastors uh, and we teach that to our church family. Then there are times, church, where we go through the narrative and we just bathe in the stories and the richness, the literary beauty of what happened as God interacted with mankind. But there are other times in a church's life where we're called to address the church or maybe even have a call to action or a call to prayer. And sadly, today's one of those days where I need to address you and have a call to action, and even a call to prayer. You see, earlier this week, we got some really bad news um, about our pastor's wife, Jana Wells. She received a cancer diagnosis. Many of you have heard, as you've stayed up to date with us um, on social media, and you've heard through the conversations with your loved ones as our church collectively is hurting. Um, I am glad to report that She's post-surgery, and she's resting in the hospital, but they're awaiting news, and they're awaiting and discerning what their next steps would be as a family. And during this time, based on the quarantine state of health care, Pastor Steve has not been able to be with his wife, Jana, consistently, and the children have not been able to be with Jana consistently, as well as both of sets of their parents. And, and so our heart just pours out for them. As a church body, I know that we are in a need of God's peace, and we have to be called to fervent prayer, church. Now hear me, and hear my heart in this. Countless many of you have had similar, if not the same, prayer requests over the years, and have had need. Many of you even now, as we've received prayer requests, deep um, and, and weighty prayer requests from you as a church even this week, and this is not to diminish any of those or to trivialize what you're going through then or even now. But in fact, we have um, the burden for our pastor and our shepherd and the relationship that, that that family has with us as a church at large. I know our church at large is hurting. And so today's message is going to be precisely for you as well. It's not just for the Wells family, though I know it's going to minister to them because that's what God's word does for us. The fact remains our pastor and our friend, for many of us a mentor, for many of you the person who led you to faith in Jesus Christ, they're hurting. And we're going to hold that family up in the same way that they've held us up tirelessly for the 16-year life of this church. As I consider the peace that's needed by the Wells family and by North Point at large, I'm reminded of the way that the Apostle Paul talks about peace in Galatians. Because you see in that passage, Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the Apostle Paul uses some strange language, even in the Koine Greek, to describe the fruit of the Spirit. 
He uses peculiar words, and we have to pay attention to that. You'll remember it because you know the verse well, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. You'll remember, of course, that the word that Paul uses for love here isn't one of the perfectly good Greek words for love, being eros or philia or storge, but no, he uses the word agape, which is a self-sacrificial love, a love that doesn't make sense. In fact, the love that Christ showed on the cross, it's a love that passes all understanding. He doesn't use the common and perfectly good word for patience, hupomone, but he uses a strong and aggressive word for patience, macrothumea, which would connote the feelings of withholding a justified wrath, something that many of us know is impossible. It would be a, a patience that only God could deliver. It's a patience that passes all understanding. When it comes to the words he uses for self-control, there were perfectly good words in the Koine Greek, nephalios and sophronismos, those self-controls that come from within, that come from striving hard, but he chooses not to use that word either. He uses the word inkratia, that is this meaning of it being empowered over chaos. It's a, it's a self-control that doesn't make sense. It's a self-control that passes, in fact, all understanding. And with peace, it's the same thing. There were common words for peace, but Paul chooses to use this word irene, this word that connotes not only peace, but a quietness and a rest. It's the later word that would be used in Philippians 4 as the peace that passes all understanding. It's a peace that doesn't quite make sense. Church, the difference between the fruit of the Spirit and the common word for that uh, that we have in English is, is the source of that. And we've talked about this before and you know it to be true. These things that come from God cannot come from within mankind. And so when we pray for his peace, when we pray for his uh, strength and for his understanding and for, for his uh, patience in waiting, we're not praying for those things that would come from within us. We're praying from the things that come from the spirit of the living God and him only. That's why those words were chosen. Let us not be praying for our peace during this time. Let us be praying for his peace. Speaking of prayers, I prayed for the best way to communicate to you today as a church family. I felt convicted to share a clip that we're going to watch together as a church. I know with this news that we've received this week, you, you desire as much as I do to hear from Pastor Steve to see him, to hear his words, to know because he's such a bastion of faith to each and every one of us what he would say about this situation. And I've had conversations with him and I can tell you his faith is strong. I trust that these words that we're about to watch from Pastor Steve, which are words from God really, will speak directly into our situation as North Point Church and will touch you precisely where you are as we watch our pastor outside of a storm, talking about the peace of God, because we need God's peace and we need God's discernment. Let's watch together. And there's a passage of scripture that has to deal with kind of understanding what it feels to have peace, because what I pray for is God to give me peace and clarity and direction. Are you with me? That's what we're praying for. I want God's peace. I want to know for sure. And so what does that peace feel like? What does it look like? What does it taste like? What does it smell like? I, I want to make sure I get it right. And when you read Philippians 4, 6, and 7, because I feel these anxieties and these worries and these things, and so I, I, when I come here to this verse, I'm trying to understand, maybe, maybe there's some answers inside this passage, and I believe today that there really are. Philippians 4, 6, and 7, it begins with this statement. It says, don't worry about anything. So in the midst of what it is that's really big and stressful in your life, God's, worry, God's word is saying, don't, don't worry about anything. Don't worry about that. Thanks, that's helpful. <laughs> Yeah, just don't worry about that. Don't be anxious about that. Instead, what does it say to do? Pray about everything. So do not be anxious, one of your translations would say. Do not be anxious, but in everything, pray about everything. So we, wanna, we want to be not anxious about anything, but in everything, we want to be prayerful. And so there's, there's an answer here, and we're going to dig into that a little bit more. But go on with the verse. Tell God what you need. 
And then you want to thank Him for what He's done. So there's a recipe here. We're going to look at it in in some practicality, and then we're going to come back and look at this verse again. So just read it in context. Verse 7, then you will experience God's peace. There it is. That's what we want. That's the goal for all of us. I want to experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. Your translation might say the peace that passes all understanding. A peace that doesn't make sense. It's like I just, like in the midst of all that's going on, I just have like this barometer of peace. Like this, this thing that just says, I'm, I'm okay. I'm not afraid. And the peace you experience will exceed anything you understand. His peace will it'll guard your heart and your mind as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, there's one final thing. You've got to fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about these things, things that are excellent and worthy of praise. And keep putting into practice all that you've learned and received from me. Everything you heard from me and saw me doing, and the God of peace will be with you. So right now, in the midst of your situation where two roads are diverging and you need to know which path to choose, and as much as it stresses you out and you realize that there are consequences when we leave out, live outside of God's plan, God is saying to us, don't be anxious about it. Don't worry about it. It doesn't mean that we just throw caution to the wind. It's simply saying that that's not the right response. The right response is do not be anxious, do not worry, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, we present our requests to God. There is a recipe that God says, that don't worry about that stuff. Don't freak out about it. There's a recipe, and it's through prayer. And that's where it's going to find us and lead us to that peace and discernment that we want. But what does it feel like when we've landed there? How do we know, in fact, that we've made it there? So that's our two questions today. We're going to look at what does peace and discernment feel like? In addition to that, what are those mental and spiritual roadblocks that can cloud our judgment and keep us from hearing from God? Because once we think we know what it is, we need to make sure that we know what our temptations are to cloud this up, and we want to get this right. Before we do, I want to look at three things to kind of set kind of the bar for us to to build upon today, a foundation. And there's three truths. I want you to write them down in your notes today. The first thing is this. We need to recognize that God knows what He is doing in your life right now. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God knows exactly what he is doing in your life right now? God's word says, don't worry, don't be anxious. But hear hear me clearly, you will never be fully secure in this. You will never be fully confident in your ability to to see peace and to understand and have peace and discernment for the situation if you don't come to grips with what this is, is that God knows what he is doing in your life. You need to be fully secure in this if this is ever going to work for you. That means that that what's happening right now, it, it wasn't a surprise to God. He wasn't caught off guard by it. This wasn't a curveball that was happening. The Lord of Heaven's armies isn't up there huddling with all those people going, boy, I didn't see that coming. Boy, that was, that was really a confusion. God understands everything. He knows every single detail about your life. When you and I understand that God knows what He's doing in our life right now, that's a game changer from the capacity of our fear and our concerns and our doubts. God teaches us in Isaiah 41, 10 that do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. God teaches us to, he'll sustain us, that we cast our cares on the Lord and he will sustain you. He'll never let the righteous fall. He teaches us that even though that we are depraved people and that we're making big mistakes and our lives are kind of a disaster sometimes with all of the things that go on, God says, my grace is sufficient for you. I know who you are. I, I, I know your quirks. I know your habits. I know your hangups. I also know your heart. I know you chase after me, and I know that you desire to have me forgive you, and you have a heart of repentance. My grace is sufficient for you. The great Philip Keller in 1970 says a quote, and I, I had written it down years ago, and it just came across it this week and was so excited to see it again because it just matches so well to what, this, what I'm trying to communicate today. And he says this, there is nothing that both quiets 
and enlivens the soul. So those two things. There's nothing that both quiets the soul and enlivens the soul as the knowledge that God knows what he is doing in my life right now. Right now, are you in a situation that's just so chaotic and so crazy that if you were just to understand that God knows what he's doing in your life right now and that he's with you right now, does it just quiet your soul? Is there something inside of that just says, okay, that's a quieted soul when you just realize, okay, God, you got this. But at the same time as it's quieting your soul, think of the opportunities that that means. Not only is he bringing you calm, but he's with you and he's walking through the situation with you. He knows what's happening in your life right now. He also knows what's happening in your life right now. And think about the opportunity that that stands before you. Think about what you'd be capable of doing. Think about there's nothing in your way as long as God is directing your steps and guiding your path and he is walking along the steps with you. Man, folks, this is an exciting proposition. So it should bring you a great sense of calm, but it should also awaken your spirit to think of all that that implies. The next thing I want you to write down is not only does God know what he's doing in your life, but recognize that God has a plan for your life. You are not the one person in all humanity that God says, ooh, I forgot to do a plan for them. (laughs) Wouldn't that be terrible? Like you're standing there, it's like, oh, hold on a second. I'll be right back. No, he's got a plan for your life. We talk about Jeremiah 29, 11 over and over again, you know, right? you know that he knows this, he has a plan for you. But, but God's word is full of verses that just would give us this confident hope that he does have a plan. Psalms 139 just tells us, as God's known you ever since you were in your mother's womb, all your days have been numbered even before you took your first breath on this earth. It's so beautiful. The third thing I want you to pay attention to, not only does God know what he's doing in your life right now and that he's got a plan for your life, but recognize this, that God will guide your steps. Write this in. God will guide your steps and direct your paths when we seek him. That if you are seeking after God and you are pursuing him with all your heart, you're trying to understand him, God's word teaches us in in Jeremiah that that you uh, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. If you are that kind of person seeking after God, God will guide your steps. He'll direct your path. God's word teaches us that man makes his way, but God directs our steps. True peace and discernment is only going to be found through one thing, and that is fervent prayer. Isaiah 26, 3 says, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you or steadfast on you because he trusts in you. That's steadfast. There's something about that he's gonna, you're going to keep him in perfect peace. Those whose heart is leaning into you, trying to make sure that you are answering their questions, Father, that you would make that God is giving you the answers and the clarity that you're desiring. You are chasing after God. You want to know so bad that it is him. The pathway to peace and the pathway of discernment is fervent prayer, being prayed up and also asking people to pray for you. But unfortunately, too often, we talk to other people way too much and we pray way too little. Jeremy, sometimes you and I are so guilty of wanting to know what God's direction and choice and path is for our life. And we are so guilty of talking way too much and praying way too little. We're talking to other people, asking them what they think more than we're talking to God, asking him what he thinks. We're brainstorming too much. We're multi-scenario planning and our brains are just become so restless. That's describing me, folks, is that I can find myself man, getting godly counsel. I love to seek godly counsel. I love to pray, and then my prayers turn into brainstorming sessions, and then multi-scenario planning, like, okay, if this happens, then this will probably happen, and if that happens, then this will happen. You're with me, right? I'm not the only person that does this when I'm trying to seek, but I'm here to tell you that that the way for us to have that peace and discernment and clarity that we need is not going to be found by asking a bunch of different people and trying to solve it in our own mind so our brains are so restless. It's going to be found through fervent prayer. The great Ian Bounds, man, he writes just book upon book upon prayer. He says, when you experience peace from God, oh, I love this, the secret places in your heart cease to be a noisy workshop. Right now inside your heart, do you have peace? Or do you have a noisy workshop going on in your brain that's just restless trying to solve, talking to anybody who will listen about your problem? Chances are you don't have peace if that describes you. But you experience peace 
And when you have it, that noisy workshop grows quiet. So that means you and I must guard our time with God. And we must beware of, of anything that distracts us from praying fervently. You know why this is important? Because when you allow other distractions and lesser things to, to command your attention and to hold your thoughts and to hamper your intensity of your prayer time, here's what's going to happen to you because it happens to me. When I allow those lesser things and those distractions to get away in the way of my fervent prayer time, when I get the answer, I doubt that this is the right answer. I don't have confidence. I, it dilutes my confidence. It, it dilutes my ability to really discern that this is God. Are you, are you paying attention to that, church family? That when we allow other things to get in the way, and we don't, when we know that we're not praying fervently with not being distracted, we're chasing after God, when we get the answer, we're like, I don't know, it could be that. could be this. Only you know if you've prayed fervently. In your situation right now, answer this question. Are you, am I, ask this question to yourself, have I prayed fervently about this thing? Only you can answer that question. And if the answer is not obvious to you, if you're like, I, I think so, I know so, then you haven't. It. it will be obvious to you because your answer is, I couldn't pray any harder. I couldn't pray any more. I couldn't set aside any more time. I couldn't fast one more day. The next thing is, is that I want you to write down, peace is found when you surrender your will. You will find peace, not only through that fervent prayer, that prayer that's just pouring out to God, but you will find peace when you surrender your will. The great D.L. Moody, love these quotes today, so many great quotes. There will be no peace in your heart. This is what D.L. Moody says. There will be no peace in your heart until your will has been surrendered to God's will. That means you will discover God's will for your life in the very same place where you let your will go. Isn't that big? You'll experience it in the same place. And I know that many of you have already recognized that. Maybe you didn't have a shelf to put it on. But there was a point in time, a decision in the past that you struggle with and wrestle with, but you, and you prayed and prayed and prayed forever. It was breaking you. It was tearing you. You lost all this weight. You didn't know what to do, but you were just seeking God. And there was a certain moment in your prayer where you just said, Lord, I just don't care anymore. I know that I wanted you to do this, but I wanted this to be the outcome, and I wanted this to be the solution, and I wanted these things at least to be the criteria of whatever you would do, but now I just don't care anymore. Whatever, whatever, God, whatever, God, whatever, God. And if you're praying right now about something, if you're seeking a job, if you're seeking a solution, if you're seeking something, and you're at a place right now in your prayers where you're just having this kind of frank conversation with God going... I just don't care anymore. I, it's not about what I want, God. And we all of a sudden, we realize in our hearts, we go, I just want really what, whatever you think is best. I just want your best plan for my life. If you are at a place where you're in a brokenness in your prayer time that's leading you to pray a prayer of sincerity like that, or just saying, Lord, I don't care anymore, I want you to know, may I encourage you in your heart, you are so close to discovering God's will. And the reason that God's been silent for so long with you and the reason he's making you wait so long is not because he doesn't want to answer you. It's just because he needs you to let go of your will so that you can clearly understand his will and that he can give you that peace that will pass all understanding. Because what you're getting ready to go through and the decision you're going to make may not be perfectly easy. There may be still a storm associated with it. There may be some fear still associated with it. And he wants you to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that he is guiding you. He is directing you. He is leading you. And he wants you to be comfortable and confident to say, I had peace when I, took this, when I made this step because God gave me the clarity that I was hungry for and asking for and chasing after him. But our desire to get out of the storm really can cloud our judgment and lead us into even bigger storms, so beware. Because peace is not to be confused with the absence of a storm. Remember, Jesus slept peaceably on a boat during a storm, teaching his disciples that you can still have peace in the midst of a storm. So I want to read to you our passage that I started off with and allow me to insert some editorial statements to help connect what we've learned. Because when you first read a passage of Scripture, it says, do not be anxious or do not worry in the midst of all that you need God to give you clarity and direction for. 
And it tells you to spend your time in prayer by petitioning God, and He'll give you the peace that passes understanding. I want you to know that we've looked through a couple lenses and some filters today, that as we read this again, maybe some of this will stand out a little more clearly, and it won't seem like it's just such an insensitive thing for God to say, don't worry about that, it'll be okay. Listen to what it says in Philippians 4, 6-9 again. Do not worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. That's the fervent prayer. Your takeaway today is to evaluate, are you praying fervently to the point of sacrificing time, food, focus, focusing everything on your answer? Are you praying fervently or are you spending more time talking to others than you are seeking after God? It says, tell God what you need. There's the contentment part and thank him. There's the heart of gratitude we just talked about. Thank him for all he's done. And then you'll experience God's peace. That's what we want, which will exceed anything we can understand. Peace that passes our understanding. And that peace will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. So that means that whenever you take that step forward into the unknown, into that scary place, into that where where peace is in the absence of fear, I'm going to be a little scared as I'm walking forward. But as you are going through that, there's going to be the peace of God that transcends your understanding, will guard your heart and your mind as you're walking through this next chapter of your life. He'll guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. And that's real joy. That's the joy of being contentment. That's the heart of gratitude. That's the heart of contentment. And now, verse 8, and now, brothers and sisters, there's one final thing. I need you to fix your thoughts. I need you to fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and uh, lovely and admirable. Think about these things that are excellent and praiseworthy. Focus on God's kingdom, not yours, but it's bigger than that is that you want God to give you clarity and peace. Think about this. This is huge. We're going to wrap up with this kind of couple statements and we're going home with one final song. Okay, so stay focused. Is that you and I want God to give us clarity. We want peace and discernment. But you are allowing into your mind and into your ears and into your heart things that are cynical and hostile and sensual and crude, hoping that clarity will bloom. Don't be a fool. Ooh, church family. You can pray all you want, but you've got to make sure that you're keeping all the other garbage out of our hearts and minds. How bad do you want to know God's best plan for your life? How much do you appreciate and recognize there are consequences when we get that wrong? How much more so is it important to you to make sure you're spending time on your knees and you're chasing after God to get clarity? Is it important to you enough to turn that radio off, to stop that news feed, to get off that social media, to turn off the internet, to do whatever it takes to say, God, I need you and you alone. Whatever is true, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, whatever is excellent, whatever is praiseworthy, let me think about those things. Because I don't want to confuse what you're trying to tell me to do with what the world's trying to tell me to do. I want your way, your best way, your best plan for my life. As we close, I just want to give you one more kind of statement. For you and I to discover real peace, we have to surrender our will We have to surrender our control and we have to surrender the idea that you don't have to understand everything that's happening in your life. But you do need to understand that God is with you. He has a plan for you. The situation that you're in is not a curveball to him. He has a plan for you and he knows what your next step needs to be. The person who has the answer for you is all he's inviting to you is seek him with all his heart. With all your heart, seek him. And he will direct your paths. Prayer. Let me pray for you. Father, our time is up, and I wish I could go on forever, Lord, about this topic, because I know that as I'm speaking, Lord, you're ministering to my heart on so many different levels, but I also sense and feel your Holy Spirit's moving in the hearts of people right now. And so, Father, as our final song gets ready to play, as we sing these lyrics, Lord, there's two things that I'm just excited about these lyrics. And one is that my heart is yours, Lord, is that I'm going to surrender my life to you to take it all. I'm going to put my life in your hands. And I'm going to pursue you with fervent prayer, Father, to discover your will for my life. In addition to that, Father, I'm surrendering everything to you. All to Jesus I surrender. 
So Father, as we sing today, may you do a work in our hearts to give us greater resolve that when we leave here today, we'll all know that we're leaving here today with a lot of praying to do. Less conversation with others and more conversation with you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church, I hope that encouraged you as much as it encouraged me. It's great to be reminded that peace is not the absence of a storm. And whatever you're facing right now, just as our church is facing this tumultuous news, just know that God is there to offer his peace. He can and he will intervene in your circumstance. As I said earlier that this was a call to prayer, I'd like to share with you the prayer that I, in fact, prayed to our great God on Wednesday afternoon when Pastor Steve first called me with the news about his beloved wife, Jana. I prayed, God, I know my faith is small, but your word says that with a small faith, you can accomplish the impossible. I know that your word promises you will provide us with the peace that passes all understanding. And that makes sense for me, for those who have never experienced your peace before. Of course they don't understand it. They've not experienced it. But God, what about those who do understand your peace? What about those who have walked with you for their entire lives? Can you move in such a, in such a mighty way that even those with a strong faith would experience the peace that you provide and it would scarcely make sense to them? That's my prayer this morning, folks. My prayer this morning for the Wells family, my prayer this morning for you and what you're going through. And so I want you to join me in fervent prayer for our pastor's wife. We're gonna pray for healing, we're gonna pray for God's will, and we're gonna pray for God to overwhelm them with the peace that comes from him. And we're going to pray for God to overwhelm you and overwhelm them with a peace that's so, such a mighty movement of his hand that even if you have experienced his peace and even if you understand that peace that passes understanding, it will be so, it will be of such a magnitude that you scarcely understand it yourselves. Let's pray. Heavenly and gracious Father, I lift up this people to you. I lift up this church Father, we need your peace right now. We need your direction. We need clarity in situations that are many. And Father, we have a common prayer, a common prayer that we desire to be found fervent in, and that's the prayer for our pastor's wife, Jana. Father, we pray expectantly for you to heal her because we know that we're still living in the age of miracles. And Father, we know that human understanding doesn't stay your hand, but that your will be done because your will is good and perfect and you've set the evaluations of circumstances in your eternal decrees and we trust you in that. But God, we know that you incline your ear to the prayers of your people and you move your mighty hand. And God, that's all we need right now. We need a movement from you. So Father, dispense peace among your people, dispense peace among the Wells family that they will scarcely understand, even though their faith is strong, that this would be a faith-strengthening experience for our entire church, and that, Father, that message today from our very Pastor Steve, our beloved pastor, would pierce the armor of each individual in only the way that the Holy Spirit can and would go directly to the hearts of the people and meet them where their need is. We pray in the mighty name of Jesus expectantly. Amen. Thank you, church family. We'll see you next week.